everyone, I'm Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Empowering Midwifery Education. This next section of our course is Routine Newborn Screening. A legal disclaimer we put at the beginning of all of our presentations, this information is for general and educational use only, not intended for substituting as professional, legal, or clinical advice. We strive to keep our information as accurately and, and timely as possible. We make no promises, guarantees of the adequacy of this information. Course objectives, the students will be able to verbalize what are the different newborn screen tests that are available. Um, you'll be able to talk about the goals of each of those screening tests, what are the risk and benefits, how to prepare the supplies, the equipment to do the various tests, um, some of the things you can outsource, some of the things you can do yourself in the postpartum home visits or if they deliver in the hospital are done by the postpartum nurses um, before their discharge. So we want to give good education to the family of the various routine newborn screenings, the timings that the newborn screenings are typically done, and the risk benefit of each of the procedures and the step-by-step -step, um, actions that the midwife would do if they're performing that routine newborn screening. So why is this important? I think it's important for all midwives to understand um, we take care of babies the first month of life. We, ha we have to be aware of the national standards, the recommendations, the screenings, the guidelines that are out there. Um, just because we don't have a newborn hearing screen machine still does not make you not obligated to have education and discussion with the family and get them referred to a, a specialist in the community that can do the hearing screen. If you choose not to do the metabolic screenings, you need to have a discussion and education with them about the resources, the labs, the places they can go to get it done. So if you choose not to do any immunizations, you choose not to do certain procedures or screenings, that's fine, but you have to at least give the education to the family of where they can be found in the community. It is our responsibility to educate the families about all the routine care standards during pregnancy, birth, postpartum, including the newborns the first month of life. If a family declines a routine screening, that's totally okay, but you've got to have informed consent, you've got to have documentation. Many states will have written consents that they want for refusal for declining that um, recommended standard. Most of the illnesses with many of these screenings are very rare, but they can be caught that many times you can't find symptoms until it's too late. So the whole point of screenings is to be preventative and proactive. And many of these procedures um, aren't that risky to have done um, a hearing screen. It's just putting uh, things over the baby's head. The heel stick for the metabolic screening, um, there is some discomfort with the blood collection, but you can breastfeed. You can do a lot of great things to help reduce the pain. Um, and then for the, the CC, the HD heart screening, the pulse ox, it, it's minimal intervention to the baby. Um, so there's a lot of simple procedures out there that midwives just need to be aware of. So what exactly are routine newborn screenings? There's many different variations of it. There's the metabolic PKU screening, the heel stick done at 24 hours of age, the metabolic screening, a lot of different areas call it a lot of different things because every state has different metabolic conditions listed part of that screening. Um, so they collect a blood sample after the baby has started to eat. It's really important that the baby is actually digesting food because they're wanting to see if the baby has some rare um, protein deficiencies and abilities not to be able to digest normal breast milk. Um, they may be on a special diet that could be causing some complications. It's a few drops of blood that you place on a piece of paper, a special form. It's mailed out after it's dried after six eight hours um, traditionally the midwives will do this to help save convenience for the families um, going to a lab and to another facility so another routine screening is the CCHD, which is the Critical Congestive Heart Disease Screening. Um, it's done with a pulse ox. You do it on the hand and the foot. You want to get it pre-ductal and post-ductal. Um, and then you want, it's a simple documentation thing. It's very not invasive. It just takes a little time. It's more of an art of not pressing on it and getting your pulse ox and heart rate, um, making sure the baby is nice and warm, getting good circulation 
relation to the hands and feet. Um, the baby is relaxed, just nursed, fed. There's kind of an art to getting some of these screenings done so it doesn't take a lot of time and that's something midwives are very, very good at and postpartum nurses. Um, it's very non-invasive, takes just 30 seconds to a minute once um, the sensor can read. You just get the preductal, postductal oxygen level as long as it's above 95%. You move on and you've done the screening. If it's lower than 95%, there's specific algorithms of how low. Um, if it's usually under 90, it's encouraged to follow up right away with a pediatrician. Um, if it's pretty significant and the baby's having respiratory symptoms going to the urgent care, if it's between that 92 to 95, I just will repeat it the next 24 hours. Sometimes it's just not getting good circulation, giving the baby a little more time for um, transition into extra uterine life. But it really depends on if the baby's alert, nursing well, peeing and pooping, healthy, good weight. There's no risk factors, nothing else obvious. Then we have a little more time on our side versus they have symptoms, their chest is blue, we have other concerns going on. Don't mess around with getting the baby further checked out. So the last routine newborn screening is the newborn hearing um, screen. It can be done by midwives that are trained or you can refer to a local audiologist with community-based midwives. Traditionally hospital-based deliveries, the midwives have the labor and delivery nurse do it. The pediatrician typically takes care of the baby in that postpartum period and the the machine and the equipment is all on the postpartum unit and we'll have it done before they're discharged. Um, it's a big barrier for the midwives because the machine is quite e expensive. I know there's a lot of states giving grants and having lead community-based midwives that'll be the expert rep that'll do home visits and get the um, hearing screen done. It's a great way to be proactive if there's deaf or um, variations of hard of hearing that you may not catch until there's learning disabilities and there's delays in development because it's already um, too late. They use simple earbuds or earphones and even if they have smile, mild hearing loss, because so many families would say to me, well, I can tell if my baby can hear or not. I clap and they turn their head and I was like, yes, you can tell if they're completely deaf or not, but you can't tell about the variations of maybe certain sounds they have trouble with and, and, and that it will impact um, their learning and development lifelong if it's not caught early. So the whole point of newborn hearing screens is to be preventative, to be proactive. We want to advocate for um, reducing the risk of morbidity, mortality, early identification, educating our families. Um, if, if they have hearing disabilities, we want to be able to get them a hearing aid right away. If they have oxygen level issues from some mild undiagnosed cardiac disease, we don't want, we want to improve outcomes and catch those things. And is it something we need to watch closely or is it something that the baby needs Need surgery. Um, maybe there is a rare metabolic condition, especially if you serve certain populations. When I serve the Amish and the Mennonites, there tends to be more genetic abnormalities than the traditional English um, communities, and you catch them on that metabolic screening. They test for lots and lots of disorders. And so it's, it's about when we offer our genetic screenings during pregnancy, it's the same standard of the metabolic screens, the hearing screens. You're wanting to reduce the risk and catch things that by the time you catch them with symptoms may or may not be too late to reverse and uh, adjust. So the PKU, the metabolic screen, the 24-hour screening, whatever you want to call it, the, the routine blood spot, everyone calls it a little different. PKU stands for phenylketonuria. It's a rare disorder that prevents the body from breaking down a substance called PHE, phenylalanine. And it's usually a specific component of food and breaking down. That's why they can't immediately have the blood test done right when they're born. It has to be 24 to 48 hours. Depending on your state, some states are really hard with 48 hour marks. Some states are hard with the 24 hour marks. So you just have to learn your local area. Um, but it's testing for specific parts of proteins and foods and artificial sweeteners and seeing if the baby is having trouble breaking down these proteins. So to prepare for the test, you want to walk the wash the heel with alcohol. Um, make sure the foot is nice and warm. There's a very specific spot on the side and the base of the heel that you want to get that has the most blood flow capillary. Um, there's specific heel stick sizes for free term, normal babies because of how deep it'll calibrate. Um, I usually will do it 
while the baby is at the tail end of breastfeeding, they're warm, they're relaxed, the blood is flowing, they're comforted by their mother. Um, it was a very easy process, but it's also an art if you've never done it before to get the right angle, to hold the piece of paper, to drip the blood, get the right amount, because if you get too little, you're going to have to redo it again. You can't just stack it on top of each other. You have to get a good drop and then drop it. And so when it dries, the, the lab can see the, the layers of little tiny pieces and you have to redo it again. So um, being a labor and delivery nurse, being a postpartum nurse for a long time, having um, lots and lots of babies in that newborn period to be able to practice on, it just takes time. And so that's something we will help the students with and help with that transition because there is an art to collecting those samples. You can send them to the lab. There's very few outpatient labs that do do them. They usually get them done in the hospital um, or the pediatrician's office, but really stressing you can't, they're gonna ask the time when baby was born and the time of the collection if you collect it within less than 24 hours, I can tell you it's always going to be denied and have to recollect. So important things to make sure you're getting accurate results and accurate. There's different ways you can reduce the pain to the baby. This picture is interesting because you're taking away gravity. You're putting the heel up in the air. Um, we would always have the mom holding the baby and the foot is down. You want to take advantage of gravity. You want to take advantage of not having to squeeze the foot so much, uh, making sure they're warm, that they're, um, they've been eating well. If they're super dehydrated and um, haven't been nursing well, I will delay it a little bit because I know I'm going to get a bit terrible sample. They don't have the blood volume to even collect. So um, you want to make sure they're nice and warm, you have their breastfeeding, you've got a pacifier, you've got a way to calm and comfort them. Um, definitely in community-based midwifery, we've got a great art to how we collect the PKU sample. So the biggest thing is just there's a lot of protein deficiencies and disorders that you're screening for with this metabolic screening. Every state is a little different what they conclude on it. This is just a list of more common ones. You're testing for cystic fibrosis, uh, HIV, you're testing for protein deficiencies, you're testing for sickle cell, toxoplasmosis. There's a lot of um, things that they can get from the baby's blood work. Um, so it's always about prevention. Um, I do encourage families to get it and some choose to and some choose not to. Um, when should the screening be done? We always have to stress, stress, stress. The 24 to 48 hour mark is the best timing. You want to get it. If you wait a week, week and a half, and the kid truly has that, you've got an extra week of damage from not having the right nutritional intake that the kiddo is needing. Um, so earlier is better, but you've got to make sure you do it um, when the baby has eaten enough amount and after delivery. So step by step, you just want to make sure you get a heel stick, you clamp, collect the sample, you let the sample sit for six to eight hours. Um, Community-based midwives usually mail it out to the state department that processes them and usually faxes the results that you can share with your family um, after they're completed. Sometimes they'll mail them out, sometimes you can just share them on the patient portal depending on what EHR system you have. Um, we don't need much for blood, but sometimes it seems like a lot and sometimes the babies are very sensitive. They cry as soon as a cold hand touches their foot, let alone squeezing their foot. So um, it can be sometimes a stressful experience for the parents, for the baby and for the midwife. If they're newer at it, the baby's not giving good samples. Um, I've had times where I've had to poke the foot three, four times to get an adequate sample. Um, and sometimes it's just location and sometimes it's the baby being cold. You get a good gauge of if I've had to poke four times and I haven't even filled my first circle, I'm not going to mess around and I'm just going to worry about it in a couple days when the baby is better hydrated. And um, there is a balancing act of not traumatizing the mom and the baby during the process and the midwife um, to get a good sac sample. The other two the other two screenings are much less invasive and much more midwife and family friendly. Um, the CCHD is the pulse ox screening on the hand and the foot. It's a very rare condition. About 200 out of 100,000 babies have the critical congestive heart disease, but it's very it requires a medical invention intervention, and it's very serious, life-threatening conditions. It can it can kill a baby and they think it's SIDS and affect them, 
purely because not getting an accurate screening from the beginning. So it's a simple procedure. It takes 30 to 60 seconds when it's done accurately. You put your results down on your day one postpartum. Um, if the baby has significant acrocyanosis, I always like to get it when they're warm, they're breastfeeding, they're relaxed, the blood is flowing to the hands and feet, and it's usually not a difficult procedure to get done. Um, the machines, the handheld machines are two to $400, depending on the company and brand. You wanna get a good quality machine. You don't wanna get a cheap one that's inaccurate, doesn't work specifically for babies. It's just not worth it. So how to prepare for the test, you want to make sure your equipment's working properly. I always carried backup batteries with me on my Dopplers, my Pulse Ox, anything that was a very essential medical piece of equipment. I always carried spare batteries, make sure the baby has nursed, the baby is nice and warm, the mom is holding the baby. It's a usually very mild procedure to get done. You're, it's just like you're putting a stethoscope on their chest. You're, you're wrapping the um, band with the light for the probe to do the pulse oximetry. It's a very simple procedure. Um, sometimes you can see simple symptoms of CCHD, but typically you can't um, until it's too late. So our whole goal is screening early identification so we can get better outcomes. Um, why do we need to do this? We talk about there's key screenings that are important to do. That 24-hour postpartum home visit, there's a lot going on. We're checking out the transition of mom, the transition of baby, how her bottom's doing, how her bleeding, how breastfeeding's going, how the baby is doing, the weight, the baby alert. The tr there's so much in that 24-hour postpartum home visit um, and that the nurses and the labor and delivery units postpartum are doing to make sure the babies are transitioning appropriately. So it is an important screening and it's really not an invasive one. It's just a habit to get into at 24 hours of age. These are the things I'm checking for. I'm checking the metabolic screening. I'm checking the pulse ox and then we'll refer out for a hearing screen to be done in the next week or two when the mom's ready to get out and about with her baby. So the benefits we keep stressing over and over again. If there's hypoxia, if there is lower oxygen that we're not catching by listening and we can't see by obvious symptoms, the pulse ox will catch those mild deviati deviations of hypoxia. We want to prevent complications and even that serious um, consequence of death. So a pulse ox, it's something you just put a little wrap around the baby's hand and foot. You get pre-ductal, post-ductal oxygen levels, put it and document it and move on. Um, it's not a big of a deal. You want to make sure your equipment's working properly. The light is working. You don't want to have your hand over the probe. So it's now getting you as a sensing test oxygen level versus the actual baby. A great way to double check that you're not getting you is you listen to the heart rate. If the heart rate's in the 120s and you're getting the pulse ox to read 80s, you're probably getting your own finger. So we can use some simple deduction to confirm that our equipment is working accurately and that we're not getting our own oxygen level and heart rate combination. Um, a lot of times if we have trouble getting the pulse ox, it's because the babies are cold, um, they're nervous, they're crying, they're tense, they don't got good blood flow. It's rare I have a problem with this um, because we're being proactive. We're getting these nice warm babies that are breastfeeding with their mama and keeping them bundled in a blanket and then just pulling out that little hand or foot when we need it for our test. There's many different machines out there that are recommended by AAP, which is the American Association of Pediatrics. Um, so you definitely wanna make sure that you're getting one that's specific for detecting CCHD defects. Um, I'm trying to remember the brand company I had, but there's usually guidelines and you wanna make sure you get the specific pulse ox that's used for newborns to screen for CCHD. So we already talked about it, but the results of under 90% are usually considered urgent care, it needs to be followed up by a pediatrician that day or sent to the ER, depending on how symptomatic the baby is being. Um, if you just can't even get it to read and the baby looks overall well, I don't stress about it. It's usually just a circulatory issue and you can just, I try to do these screenings at the beginning of the visit as best as possible and then check it again at the end of the visit um, after they've been warmed up a bit. and 
if we still can't get it we'll just do it the next visit um, as long as the baby's looking great on every other aspect of the screen that we do um, for our newborn exam. If the baby does not pass the pulse ox screening, definitely getting a pediatrician involved, a healthcare provider, someone that can do a more thorough analysis of the baby's heart, lungs, and make sure there's nothing of major concerns. So the last routine screening, which is typically not done by the midwives, there are a few midwives trained in it. It comes down to a barrier of the cost of the hearing screen machine. Um, so I always encourage community-based midwives to either pool together, have a great um, audiologist they can refer to. There's great state grants they can get to get these machines to help improve um, the newborn hearing screen. Because I think out of all of the testings, this one is missed the most because the midwife isn't typically doing it directly and she'll encourage the families, hey, schedule this audiology appointment. But after the first month of life, it tends to not be followed up with well. Sometimes the pediatricians are very good to follow up on it and sometimes they're not. So I'd say out of all the routine hearing screens, for all the routine screens, the hearing one is the the least compliant because it's just got extra steps to go to the audiologist, to schedule an appointment, get out with a brand new baby. If you live in a rural community, it's a distance to travel. It's definitely one that needs repeated reminders of education to get done and documentation that discussion occurred. And if the family declines it, they decline it, but you have to make sure that they want it done, that you're helping to make them successful to get it done. It is a rare thing to have hearing loss with a baby in one or both of the ears, one to two babies out of every hundred thousands. But if that's your baby, a simple non-invasive 10 minute screening could have massive impacts on the baby's development, the language, the just that brain overall with them being able to hear as soon as possible. So we really want to stress that it is encouraged. The nice thing is if they deliver in the hospital, they're transferred, they're planning a hospital delivery, um, the hearing screen is done before they're discharged home. But if you are a community-based midwife, this is something part of the screening recommendations you definitely want to follow up with, whether you're the one doing the screening or you are referring out for it. If you're deciding to do this screening, you have the testing, the equipment, you did the training, you, it's similar to the other screenings. You want the baby to be sleeping, rested, nursed, warm, comfortable. Um, you put the electrodes, you put the, um, the equipment on the baby's head because you want them holding as still as possible. Um, and it usually takes 10 minutes to get done. Uh, it's usually not too terrible as long as the baby's not restless. If the baby's restless, it's a very difficult procedure to get done. There are many situations where the baby needs another test and it's not because they have hearing issues. It's such a sensitive machine that if the baby is restless and moving even just a slight bit, it just is inconclusive or you get inaccurate results. So you want to make sure um, that you're getting the right timing for getting the audiologist or the midwife to do that newborn hearing screen right after nursing in a good deep sleep. Sometimes there's soft headphones you can put over the baby's ears and then it'll help a little bit. The test can range from five to 15 minutes depending on how, um, honestly, how much the baby is moving around. So the whole point of a screening, we want to do this to make sure we're not missing those rare hearing anomalies, not just the severe death that are obvious if you clap and the baby responds, but the also the mild variations of hearing loss that can affect their development and their speech lifelong. Um, so we definitely want to educate and advocate, especially if there's a family history of hearing loss, um, we really want to strongly encourage because there are risk factors at play. Um, the whole point is to identify hearing loss, be proactive to get them treatment, get them the right equipment so that they can hear better and have a successful lifelong development. Um, it's a routine part of postpartum care. It's usually done either before the baby discharges home from the hospital or the first few weeks after delivery. There's no hard rule of when it has to be done. We just want to make sure that it's on our checklist and we're, we're responsible for the babies the first month of life um, that we are making sure that gets coordinated and that's documented. It has been done and what the results are. So a step-by-step -step guide. Um, it's usually done after the baby is 12 hours of age. There's, it 
can be done at two days, two weeks. There's no hard rule of when it's too late. Um, it's more about what works best for if they deliver in the hospital, get it done before they leave the hospital. If they're community based, when are they in town? When are they going to be able to schedule and get it done with the audiologist? Um, you want to make sure that the baby is warm, calm, quiet, just nursed. If the baby can be held by the parents, it helps um, having them swaddled in a bassinet. There's different Different things you can do so they're not restless to get the testing done. There's different types of machines um, and some are more sensitive for newborns and just depends on what the audiologist, the midwife is trained in, what they have grants for, what is available in their local area. Um, there's ones that you can do the soft earbuds being held. I'm more commonly familiar with the ones with the electrodes that you put on the baby's forehead and the, the nape of the neck. So there's just variations of how to do it. The automated auditory brainstem response, AABR, is one of the more common ones that's used. So I just want you guys to know that there is variations of how the equipment can be utilized and depending on your local norms and training. So if a baby does not pass, we always reinforce that there may be fluid in the ear, it may be them wrestling, there may be too much background noise, like there's a lot of things that can cause a baby to not pass. So we really reinforce that it doesn't mean your baby is deaf. Um, we will repeat it, we will get more further sensitive equipment, we will um, follow up with the audiologist. And I always reinforce that most of the time, it's just the timing of that, that specific screening versus the kid truly has a hearing problem. So just as an overall conclusion, there's many different routine newborn hearing screens, metabolic screens, CCHD screenings that are part of the midwifery scope and educational responsibilities. It's our job when we're taking care of the babies the first month of life, especially in community-based midwifery, that we need to make sure we're educating, advocating, documenting. If people choose or don't choose to have a screening, a consent, a choice, that's their, that's their right. But we also got to make sure we're educating them and giving them full information to understand the procedure, understand the risk and benefits, understand completely what a screening and a testing is being done for. So the more common ones are the metabolic screenings. They vary by state by state. What is included on that list? The CCHD screening, which is the pulse ox, the oxygen reading around 24 hours of age. Um, and then the last one is the hearing screen, which is typically referred out to an audiologist and doesn't have as specific of a timeline of sensitivity of when to get done. So the whole point of newborn screenings is to educate the providers, the family, catch things early, um, especially the CCHD you want to catch those serious interventions that could cause serious complications like death. And so our whole point is to improve outcomes for moms and babies.